2 Corinthians 4 and verse number 1. The Bible says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God and the face of Jesus Christ. And this will be the main point, main verse from our text this morning, of our message this morning, verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. This morning I'd like to talk about the subject of treasure in earthen vessels. Lord, I ask you for your help, for your strength, your guidance. And Lord, I pray that you would help me to preach your word with clarity, um, with confidence and courage in you. Speak to every heart, I pray. May I say exactly what you want said and the manner you want said, but if I can't, I, I can't do anything without your power and your help and your filling. So anoint this message, anoint me, help me, I ask. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I often use the stories um, of, and explanations perhaps of some passages from who was known as the Prince of Preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Uh, Spurgeon wasn't perfect, but he was a man of God that you, was used of God to get Bible truth to his generation and the nation of England. God used him there as well as here. Um, for the most part, he was biblically sound and a great man of God. He wrote volumes on the Bible. Um, God used him. Spurgeon shared his testimony in one of his messages, and let me, I want to read part of his salvation testimony. Some of you may already know it, but he said, I sometimes think I might have been in darkness and despair until now, had it not been for the goodness of God and sending a snowstorm one Sunday morning while I was going to a certain place of worship. When I could go no further, I turned down a side street and came to a little primitive Methodist chapel. In that chapel, there may have been a dozen or 15 people. I had heard of the primitive Methodist, how they sang so loudly they made people's heads ache. (laughs) But that did not matter to me. I wanted to know how I might be saved. And if they could tell me that, I did not care how much they made my head ache. The minister did not come that morning. He was snowed up, I suppose. At last, a very, at least, uh, I'm sorry, at last, (laughs) a very thin-looking man, a shoemaker, or tailor, or something of that sort, went up into the pulpit to preach. Now it is well that preachers should be instructed. But this man was really stupid. He was was obliged to stick to his text for the simple reason that he had little else to say. The text was, Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, from Isaiah 45, 22. And that day, as he said, that stupid preacher preached, and Charles Haddon Spurgeon trusted Jesus Christ to be his Savior, a man that was seemingly, as he said elsewhere, he was seemingly snookered into preaching that morning, or that night, because no one else would. He was instrumental in one of the greatest men of God in modern history to be saved. God delights in taking simple things, small things, and doing great things. The book of 2 Corinthians has a lot to say about small things. One of the central themes of the book, uh, I think, could be summarized in one word, and that's weakness. Weakness. In 2 Corinthians, we find many things that God uses to make us strong. And I'll just run through them for time. uh, Don't don't turn to them unless you just want to write them down. But 2 Corinthians 3, 4 says we have a trust-filled confidence that strengthens us in Christ. In 2 Corinthians 3, 12, we have a hope that strengthens us in Christ. In 2 Corinthians 4.1, we have a ministry that strengthens us in Christ. In 2 Corinthians 4.13, we have the spirit of faith who strengthens us in Christ. In 2 Corinthians 6.10, we have all things that strengthens us in Christ. In 2 Corinthians 8.1, we have great promises that perfect us and strengthen us for Christ. 
But the point is, God is always at work and make in, in our lives and bringing weak things and to a place of being able to use them. Uh, God likes to take weak things and get honor out of them through our incapabilities. And in your impossibilities, God uses them, God uses your weakness to get glory from you and to get glory from your life. In our text, with that in mind, we find our text in chapter 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure, we'll talk about that, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We, have, we are the earthen vessels. We may not use that terminology, but... We are clay or dirt pots. That's what you are. You're a clay or dirt pot. And God wants to get glory out of that dirt pot. I want you to know that no matter what you are, no matter what you've been through, no matter what has happened to you or what you've done, if you allow Him to, God can get great glory out of your life. This morning I want to talk about the treasure in earthen vessels. Let me give you three truths quickly. Number one... We have a glorious treasure. We have a glorious treasure. Verse 7 says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Again, when the Bible refers to earthen vessels, it's talking about clay pots or vessels that would normally, in the Bible, be used for holding valuables. Um, On my dresser, I have what I call my man box. (laughs) It's, It's, I don't know why I call it that. It's a little wood box and, shut up. But anyways, (laughs) but but I keep, you know, um, I keep my pistol in there and my knife and um, collar stays and a few little trinkets and things like that. So um, and some of you know what some fun things I have. But often buried in, God would take these earthen vessels, these clay pots, and keep their valuables in them, the things that were special to them. And sometimes they'd bury them in the ground and the clay vessel would keep them safe um, from being messed up. But the importance of the box was not the box. It was the thing that the box was holding. It wasn't, it didn't matter how pretty it was, it was cheap, (laughs) went a whole lot to it. But he says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. You are the earthen vessel, your body, yourself is the dirt pot, and inside of you, inside of that thing is the treasure. Well, what is the treasure? That's all that really matters. Verse number six, verses actually four through six explain that, dealing with the gospel, but I think verse six lays it out in the most thorough way. It says, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I was just thinking, I told all of you to shut up a second ago. I think that's funny. I've been around Brandon too much the last couple of days. I've told him to shut up about 50 times, I think. But anyways, uh, when he talks, tells my wife bad things about me. But for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. <laughs> The light is the, the light of the gospel. There's, let me give, I broke it down in three other categories, but the light of the gospel is our treasure. Verses 3 through 6 makes it clear that there are many who have the gospel hid from them. We have it, and we are the hiders. If the gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. By the way, you're not supposed to hide it. The lost need to know it. We need to make it revealed. We need to reveal the truth of the gospel. The gospel, is the, the gospel that we sometimes hide and the gospel that the devil hides and blinds people from is the message that Jesus Christ loves them and how he died for them and how he rose again. He can save anyone that, they'll put their, that will put their faith in him for salvation. But the good news that, that even though we're sinners, he loves us and that our loving God God took our punishment. We deserve to be punished for our sins. We deserve to die for our sins. The wages of sin is death. We deserve to not only die physically, but to die and spend eternity in hell, separated from God forever. We deserve that. But Jesus Christ, while He was on the cross, died in your place. He took your sin debt. He was separated from God and salvation has been purchased. He took your place. And if you will simply trust in Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins and to save you, you're saved forever. Jesus Christ offers the gospel, but the light, the understanding, the truth of the gospel is our treasure. We have it if you're saved, you have it, but that, sh- the, that gospel, the truth of it, it shines. It is a light, he says. It shines on our sin. It shows us our need. It shines upon Christ and shows us our Savior. It points to Jesus and shows us how we can have salvation and have a relationship with God. But the gospel makes all the difference in the world in whether or not we know Jesus. The gospel is the truth that allows us to be saved, allows us to be the children of God and have a relationship with Him. But the light of the gospel is our treasure. 
But it says to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. The light of knowing God is our treasure. The light is knowing something, but not just something, but someone. It's knowing God. Let me ask you, do you remember when the light was turned on for you? It wasn't just an intellectual awakening. It wasn't just, well, now I'm going to start going to church. Now I'm going to start reading my Bible. But do you remember when you finally, for the first time, understood the gospel? You understood your guilt. You understood your need for Christ. I remember I heard the gospel and God was dealing with me. But I remember sitting in a service at a camp and the light was turned on. And I finally deeply understood my guilt and my need for Jesus. And that night I trusted Christ to save me. And then the light was truly turned on when I knew God. But there's great revealing and light in knowing God. It was a wonderful day when I finally understood, truly understood God's love for me. There's great treasure in realizing God's wonderful love and His compassion. But the light of Christ's glory is also our treasure. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God, he says in verse 6. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It's His greatness. His glory is His power. His glory is His patience. His power is His holiness. And yet, in His perfection, in His glory, He reaches out to you and me. We could summarize it probably more concisely, but our treasure is God. It's what God's done in your life. It's knowing Him. It's having a relationship with Him. It's the difference that He's made in our life. The treasure can be summed up in the transforming power that the Lord's gospel makes in our life. It's God and what God gives to us and has given to you already. I read this story a couple weeks ago when I was preparing for this message, but George Weller, he described an incident on the Battle of the Java Sea, during, if I'm saying that right, during World War II. There was a destroyer um, that had been torpedoed, and 116 men were struggling for their lives in the oil-covered waters. They're swimming around, clinging to rafts, trying to save themselves, but their cries for help were answered but the cries from three, there were other cruisers coming, but they were also seeking help. They said, but only some unknown friendly hand aboard the USS Houston had the quickness of mind to throw them an illuminated life preserver. It was the light attached to it that guided a British destroyer to their rescue. Regulation Army, American Navy life belts with a floating light attached tossed overboard from the cruiser were the means that saved the lives of those 116 men. That not only supported them in the dark, troubled waters, but the light led them to their final safety. The light of the gospel lights the way to life. (laughs) It lights the way to Christ, to relationship with Him. And everyone needs the light. The greatest treasure on earth is a personal relationship and connection and understanding of God. And if you're saved, you have that treasure. But even though we have great treasure, we have a glorious treasure, we have a great weakness. It says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Again, an earthen vessel, it's a clay pot. It's a container just to hold things. I think it's very fitting how he calls that. In Genesis 2-7, it says, "...and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul." God took dirt and He formed it and He made man out of it and then gave, breathed life into it. You and I are nothing but dirt. (laughs) That's where we came from, but God breathed life into us. God has chosen to take treasure and put it in you in a dirt pot, (laughs) in an earthen vessel, in a clay vessel. These earthen vessels, these pots made from clay were cheap. They were breakable. They were fragile. They were easily replaced and they were virtually valueless. But what made them of value is the one that put the treasure in them. There's nothing special about a clay pot. If you go to Walmart or Lowe's, you can find those little cheap clay pots, you know, or brown, nothing fun about them. And they're a dime a dozen. They're more than a dime, but they're not worth much. But (laughs) everything's more than a dime. But you can get them just about anywhere. There's nothing to them. But even though to many people those things would be valueless, and to many people you may be valueless, you are of great value to God. We're of much value. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. He deals with not the point of the message isn't necessarily our value, but our weakness. We're all weak vessels that hold great treasure. In the same book, in 2 Corinthians 3, 2, 
That's not what I'm looking for. Um, <laughs> I wrote down the wrong text. Of course I did. But let me, somewhere in this book, it says, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Our sufficiency is of where? It's of God. God wants us to understand our frailness, our fragility, our fragileness, our insufficiency. Many of you believe that you are incapable of doing much for God. By yourself, that's true, by the way. Uh, many of us, I know myself, I somewhat joke about this, but I think it is pretty true. But we often think of ourselves, or I think of myself often as unintelligent, um, not eloquent, um, untrained, or not talented. Good. If you think yourself as untalented, insufficient, well, good. You are a clay pot. You're a dirt pot. That's what you are. And we all are. Psalm 103, 14 says, For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth, God remembereth that we are but dust, or we are dust. We are all weak. 2 Corinthians 10, 12, For we dare not make ourselves of the number, or compare ourselves with some that commend ourselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. I wrote that verse in there on purpose. Do you know what we often do? Why we think of ourselves so poorly at times, and we wrongly focus on that is because we as dirt pots look at that other dirt pot we think that dirt pot is a better dirt pot than I am I can't be used of God like that dirt pot that dirt pot's bigger or prettier or does this it doesn't matter we're unwise we're foolish when we get jealous of other dirt pots that's encouraging to me I often think of people that are much better speakers or more people. Pers- I'm an introvert. Some people, we're Jessica's stepdad, he doesn't know a stranger. We were talking to him about this and asking him how he talks to people. <laughs> it's funny because I don't know how to talk to people half the time. I wish I was that way. I, can, I look at people like that and I get jealous of that dirt pot. <laughs> no, if my father-in-law is watching, no offense. Um, <laughs> there's great preachers that have done great things. And I get jealous of those dirt pots. I'm unwise because we're all dirt pots. And God can use any old dirt pot because of the treasure that we have <laughs> that God puts in us. Every talented person is a dirt pot. Every intellectual is a dirt pot. We're all on equal ground. The point of the message is 2 Corinthians, again, is our weakness, our insufficiency. Yet God puts the gospel in us to reveal His greatness to others. One of my favorite verses, it used to be my life verse, it probably still should be, 1 Corinthians, I guess it's more than one verse, 1 Corinthians 1, in verse 26. 1 Corinthians 1, 26, when God first put a desire in my heart to preach, my immediate thought was, there is no way I can. That's a good place to be. To some extent, First Corinthians one twenty six. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. I love that thought, and I'm not. I don't think I'm. Try, I don't think I'm trying to be overly humble to impress. But that means God chose me. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to not things that are, that no flesh should glory in His presence. Do you ever think there's something that God wants you to do that you can't do? Good. God's chosen you. He's picked you. You're the favorite. You're the one that He wants to use. God doesn't often use people that think themselves to be, to be something. No, God likes to take dirt pots, clay pots, and get glory out of them. That no flesh should glory in His presence. God wants to use people that He can get glory from. God doesn't want to use somebody that thinks too highly of themselves. God doesn't want to use someone that thinks, I'm a beautiful pot. God wants to use a dirt pot like you. That no flesh should glory in His presence. God chooses to use the simple, the weak things. That means we're capable with God. I told you I had three truths. Number one, we have a glorious treasure. Number two, number one, we have a glorious treasure. Number two, we have great weaknesses. We're just a dirt pot. Number three, we can use, I'm sorry, God can use our weakness to share his treasure. God can use our weakness to share his treasure. The end of our text verse. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Why? That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. 
Why would God put the miraculous ability to enlighten, to lead, to influence, and to save people forever in earthen vessels? That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Why does God use simple things? Because He gets glory out of them. Why does God use people that can't do it? So that when everyone looks, they know that God did it. Let me show you a couple of verses that may be obvious. Jeremiah 18, if you would turn there. Old Testament book. Jeremiah 18. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations. If you're around there, you're getting close. Jeremiah 18 and verse number 1. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, and it seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. God can do things with the clay pot. (laughs) But no, no, pastor, I've failed too many times. I've caused permanent damage. If God can renew the pot of the nation of Israel that had themselves destroyed, were full of idolatry, if God can take that nation and make a new pot out of it, surely God can do that with you. Remember Gideon? God chose a scared little man to lead Israel against a much greater army of the Midianites. God tells Gideon there are too many Israelite soldiers, so those that are scared can go home. I'm sure it's encouraging when two-thirds of his army goes home. (laughs) Still too many, God says. God narrows it down to 300. These 300 soldiers go to battle with a sword in one hand and a clay pot, a clay pitcher in the other with a light in it. In Judges, let me read it. I should have already turned there. In Judges chapter number 7, and I'm going to skip around, but Judges 7 verse 16, and he divided 300 men into three companies and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. In verse 20, the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow with all. And they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp. And all the host ran and cried and fled. God used these 300 men with a clay pot and a light in it to destroy 120,000 people in an army with busted up clay pots. God can get glory and share light for others with any clay pot that will allow Him to. God can use any person that puts themselves in their hands. It doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter what damage you've caused. It doesn't matter what you're going through today. If you allow God to use you an old clay pot, He can. Because it's not about the clay pot, it's about the treasure, it's about the Jesus Christ Himself, it's about the glory of God, it's the light of the gospel that lives inside of you. I'm encouraged by the fact that God can use anyone that will place themselves in His hands to do far greater things than we're ever capable. So let me ask you, and I'll be done, do you see yourself as incapable? That's probably good because you are incapable. You are a clay pot. But God can do great things out of incapable people. But then if you think you're too far gone, you're not. It's good to be on the road of humility, thinking humbly of yourself, poorly of yourself. But don't go too far down that road of, I'm so humble that God can't use me. That's not humility, that's unbelief. We should be humble and see our need for God. But in our humility, saying that we can't do anything on our own, let's remember, not only can I not do anything on my own, but I have a great God who can do great things through me. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. It's not about us. It's about God. 
So number one, do you know him as your savior? If you don't know him, he can't use you. If, you've never, if, never, if there's never been a specific moment in your life where you trusted Jesus Christ and Christ alone to be your savior, you're lost and God can't use you. You need to know the Lord. He's not in your life. He cannot help you if he's not in you. Number two, confess your failures and let him clean you up. Maybe you are that vessel, that clay pot that is dirty. Get it clean. But then if you are there, tell him he can have you and stay surrendered to his control. You are all just like me. We're all clay pots. We have a great God that can do great things with us. We let him.